Hello everybody and welcome to another episode of MMT Mondays. I am Enzo Godella with Real Progressives and I will be your host this week. In today's episode we will be covering Stephanie Kelton's interview with The Nicole Sandler Show in which they will be discussing the proper MMT response to the COVID pandemic. If you've been paying attention to the news, it's probably no surprise to you that we seem to be entering a new Great Depression. Just look at the massive unemployment numbers, or all the debt that families have been forced to get into during this time, or just how many tenants haven't been able to pay the rent these past couple of months. All the while, all the government has been doing is pumping huge loads of money to the uber rich and giving the rest of us $1,200 that many of us haven't even received yet. There's no way for many of us to fight against this and the situation is only getting even more harsh for many, many families across the nation. That said, do keep in mind that we have been building toward this moment for a very long time. And yes, the Trump administration's economic policy has been disastrous, even beyond the COVID response. Just look at their ludicrous 2017 tax cuts, which overwhelmingly favor the rich, or his tariff wars, which have been hurting our workers at every level of industry. All the while he keeps bragging about low unemployment numbers or whatever, even though, what was it, 75, 76% of workers live paycheck to paycheck, and roughly 40% struggle to meet even their most basic human necessities every month. But even then, this isn't just a Trump issue. This is an issue that has been echoed by both Republicans and Democrats going all the way back to the 1970s, all the way back to the Jimmy Carter administration, which some of you may not be aware of this. But even back then, the left was still pushing for very progressive policies, including things like public health care and the federal jobs guarantee. Policies that got shut down by the fiscally conservative Democrats led by President Jimmy Carter. This narrative would eventually be put on steroids by the Ronald Reagan administration and by every administration ever since. We got the George H. W. Bush tax cuts and deregulation, then Bill Clinton signed into law the Graham Leach Bliley Act which repealed Glass-Steagall and the regulatory policies put in place by FDR after the Great Depression. And of course, this movie is directly responsible for the 2008 financial crisis. Then came George W. Bush with further deregulation, etc. And then we get to Obama. Praised by many liberals, especially those in the higher economic echelons, as the best president in their lifetimes, we can't ignore the fact that Obama, yes, he did halt the Great Recession. But he also refused to address the structural problems that gave us the recession to begin with. The recovery from the recession was very slow and honestly very weak. We never got the quality jobs that we had pre-recession times. Instead, the new jobs that we did get, A, paid us less, and B, hired us for fewer hours. Our wages have not been keeping up with real production in decades. It was supposed to be that, as time went on, our quality of life would improve, right? Instead, we work harder, we work longer, and we live poorer than our previous generations. But it's alright, they tell us, because the stock market is soaring right now. And that's supposed to make us feel better how? About half of people in this country do not own any stocks. And for the people who do, it's only a small minority that actually get noticeable benefits from this rise in the stock market. For the rest of us, what we are experiencing is a corporate class that is quite content with burning down the economy because they know they're just gonna get bailed out by the government anyway. And they better get bailed out because if they're not, then the ones who are going to end up in an even worse position are you and I. So what we need right now is for our representatives to learn modern monetary theory, to do away with their nonsensical restrictions and public spending that they have imposed upon themselves, and to actually spend for our sake. Different experts have already suggested different proposals that they would like to see implemented. Rohan Gray and Rashida Tlaib, for instance, are pushing for the minting of the coin, which would give us monthly recurring payments. Pavlina Cherneva has spoken about nationalizing the payroll, 
and Stephanie Kelton in this video will comment about the need for a federal jobs guarantee, which our numbers right now are out of this world. But even in non-pandemic times, many households already struggle because the private market will not hire them. We need a public alternative to that. We need to do away with unemployment. Right now, it's just absolutely clear that we do. But even beyond the pandemic, even once we're done with this pandemic, we have to safeguard people's rights to an income and to be employed and to be part of the national economy. With all that said, let's head right into the video. I hope you all enjoyed and I'll see you back here from the other side. I'm, I'm so, so happy, happy to be able to welcome Stephanie Kelton back to the show. Stephanie is an economist uh, and, and an educator. She's currently a professor at Stony Brook uh, University, was formerly a professor at University of Missouri, Kansas City. She's served as an advisor to Bernie Sanders' 2016 presidential campaign. And her new book is coming out uh, soon, I think next month. It's called The Deficit Myth, Modern Monetary Theory and the Birth of the People's Economy. Stephanie Kelton, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, wh when is the book officially out? June 9th. June 9th. So we're getting there, getting close. <laughs> yep. Seems like it's taken forever, but we're almost there. Okay, and and the timing is is perfect because I would think right now a lot of people are even more curious about modern monetary theory than before. Before we get into that, though, I got to ask you: We are. I, I reached out to you because um, Friday we watched the new job numbers come in for April. The U.S. economy lost 20.5 million jobs last month. The unemployment rate went from 4.4 percent to 14.7 percent, at the, the highest since 1939 when they started keeping track of these things. Um, are we officially in a depression? Well, I mean, there's not really a universally agreed upon definition, but I think by most reasonable accounts, um, this has risen to historic standards that look very much like uh, depression level um, unemployment numbers. So eventually, I'm sure we will reach the point where people um, begin to describe the situation that we're in in terms of the economy as a depression. It's frightening. I mean, when you saw those numbers and, and we were prepared for them, I mean, in fact, they were bracing us for an even higher. They said the unemployment rate could be up as high as 16 percent. It was only 14.7. But on Face the Nation this weekend, uh, Kevin Hassett, who's a White House economic advisor, said he thinks the unemployment rate, uh, rate will rise to north of 20 percent next month because this only measured like halfway through April. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, um, you know, the, the estimates vary, of course, but um, there are people out there who have warned that we could see unemployment, official unemployment figures rise above 30 percent. I think former Fed chairperson uh, Janet Yellen has suggested that, you know, that's a that's a reasonable um, forecast to be thinking about right now. So, in other words, levels of unemployment that exceed what we experienced in the Great Depression, which was about 25 percent or one in four uh, people out of the um, unemployed. Right. And and before this happened, before we got hit with the coronavirus pandemic, um, the employment picture was already kind of shaky because of new uh, 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 new new uh, you know, uh, technology and, and artificial intelligence and um, consolidation. I mean, my, my I worked my entire career in the broadcasting industry. We've seen massive job losses over the last decade or so due to technology, due to um, things called voice tracking and, and the consolidation of, of uh, big broadcasting companies. Um, so we were already hurting. And then for this to happen and all these massive job losses, this is these are scary times when you look at these numbers as an economist, Stephanie, does it freak you out? Oh, well, no question. I mean, you, the, the idea that 20 plus million people uh, lost jobs in a single month is jarring for any economist. Uh, there's absolutely no question that this is, you know, on a on an order of magnitude beyond what 
um, we think about, we think about, you know, ways to respond in terms of economic policy, the macroeconomic policy response. You know, we all have these textbooks. We teach our students um, if something happens in the economy to create uh, a downturn, a slowdown in the, um, you know, in the economy. There are things that policymakers can do using fiscal and monetary policy. But these are sort of tinkering at the margins. You know, there's nothing that you can turn to the page in the textbook that tells you how to handle 20 million people losing their jobs in a single month. So yes, and and you know, your point about uh, where we were prior to this, of course. You know, Donald Trump would would tell you that we had the greatest economy in the history of the universe, right. that he was the greatest jobs president God ever created. Uh, the official unemployment rate was down around three and a half percent. But, you know, the thing is that most of the new jobs that were created since the last crisis, remember the 2008 financial crisis and the Great Recession, took us 76 months to claw fully our way back to where we erased all of the job losses and started creating additional net new jobs. So um, that was a very long and slow economic recovery. But as you point out, the jobs that were created were overwhelmingly low hour and low wage jobs. So we didn't bring back the higher paying, better jobs that were lost in the last recession. We brought back jobs, but we replaced them with lower paying, lower wage, uh, lower hours jobs. So you're right to say it wasn't you know, the be all and end all uh, labor market that President Trump would have had us believe. Right. And but he keeps repeating those uh, numbers and the, those claims. Uh, in fact, he went on uh, last week to say, I built the best economy in the history of the world um, just to, you know, um, <laughs> drive home. He built nothing. Right. This was building on the Obama administration's turning around of the disastrous economy left by the Bush administration. When Obama took office, we were losing, what, 900,000 jobs a month or something ridiculous like that? And and we've been, we had been until last month on a steady 11-year climb with the economy getting better and better, right? So Trump built on the Obama administration's turnaround of the economy. Am I overstating that? Well, no, not entirely but again those jobs that we did bring back in most instances were not as good as the jobs mm -hmm. that had been mm -hmm. lost so mm -hmm. we i don't want to give five stars to you know the the last 10 years or so either but you're absolutely right to say that you know donald trump doesn't get to take credit for a, a long-term trajectory of steady but fairly low economic growth and steady improvement in uh, in the labor market. Right. So he'll say whatever he's going to say. We've learned that every time he opens his mouth, lies come out and we can't trust what he says. Um, uh, again, the Obama administration didn't, again, we, we didn't see jobs come back with, you know, uh, higher salaries. We saw some numbers come back, but, you know, but again, I'm, I'm pointing out Trump saying I built the best economy in, in the history of the world. And that simply is just not true. No, he and, didn't totally destroy it. Uh, and he, you know, I mean, what did he do? What is the major legislative accomplishment from this administration over the last three years? What is it? Big it's tax cut for billionaires. Right. It's the tax cuts that were pushed through in December of 2017. That is the major legislative accomplishment. You said it exactly correctly that we did big tax breaks for corporations on the corporate income tax side. And when it came to the personal income tax, what you and I uh, pay, the benefits went disproportionately to the people who least needed the help. 83% of the benefits went to people in the top 1% of the income distribution. So, you know, he did that. We got some deregulation and then he did the tariffs. Yeah. And so, yeah. you know, to the extent that he counterbalanced some of the harmful impacts that his tariffs caused with a little bit of a break for people in the bottom 99 percent, you know, where 17 percent of the benefits went to people in the bottom 99 percent. Um, he didn't totally wreck everything, but he absolutely did not and could not possibly credibly take credit for uh, a booming, thriving um, U.S. 
economy, economy under right. the administration. Now, now, one thing, Stephanie, that's happened since Trump took office is uh, the stock market. Um, and and some pundits, some people in the administration, Trump included, will point to the stock market to say, look how great the stock market's doing. That just proves that our economy is doing so well. Well, there are most of Americans, myself included, don't have any money invested in the stock market. And just because the stock market's doing well doesn't mean the economy is doing well for us. What kind of an indicator is the stock market on the overall health of the economy? Well, you know, sometimes there is a correlation that makes some sense. Mm -hmm. You see a healthy, growing economy, um, you see workers doing better, and you can see the stock market improving alongside that sort of thing. Okay, it happened uh, in the last uh, four years or so of the Clinton administration. But for the most part, there's a large disconnect between these two things, right? Where um, what what is perceived as uh, good for the stock market can actually be quite bad for the working people of this country. So in other words, you saw the job numbers, mm -hmm. uh, the unemployment rate the other day, you said 20.5 million yeah, people right. lost jobs. And what did the market do that day? It went up. It went up. It went up. Um, so look, I think that a lot of what we are seeing with uh, respect to the stock markets today is that investors feel very confident that the Federal Reserve is going to pull out all the stops, do whatever it takes to protect big corporations, to protect investors, to protect, protect the financial system. And that is building confidence in terms of investors who aren't fleeing the stock market in terror because they feel like the Fed has their back. And they do. Right. And in fact, you know, for those of us who are wondering why the stock market is still relatively doing well, it's down, we're recording this 10 o'clock uh, Monday morning, down 221 now. It's been down around 200 points since it opened about a half hour ago. Um, but but it's, I mean, uh, over 24,000. And, uh, and for those of us wondering how, the Fed has been injecting record amounts of money to keep it going, haven't they? Well, yes, and you also, I think, have to ask, what is the alternative? Mm -hmm. I mean, if we just mm -hmm. stepped back, if the Fed just stepped back and, you know, didn't have these lending facilities and didn't stand ready to provide liquidity and support businesses in this moment, then we would just start seeing a cascading wave of failures across, you know, the, um, the corporate sector, business community, and we'd have an even worse unemployment picture. So we're in a situation where... Um, it, to a very large and real extent, protecting some of these firms and municipalities and backstopping others uh, indirectly does help to support jobs. It's just that the Fed is, you know, one institution, the Fed can lend, it can't spend. And what we really need is much, much more support coming from the fiscal side, coming from Congress, because as I said, the Fed can lend, it can't spend. And oh. what we need is not to layer more debt, right? More lending means more debt. We need Congress to step up and um, protect jobs and shore up the economy using fiscal policy. Right. And now we learn that the House is working on the next a uh, round of, of stimulus. They have like a $1.2 trillion package that they want to introduce. And when I say the House, I mean the Democrats leading the House. Republicans, though, are starting to do their old, oh, no, too expensive. We can't spend the money. Um, here we are in the U.S. We, we all, most of us, have gotten our $1,200, whatever they want to call it, stimulus check. Um, and those who haven't will get it shortly. But I, I've been talking to people all over the world. I've been doing this segment called Quarantine Calling, where I check in with people in different countries. And every other country I've spoken to, people are getting real serious, <coughs> excuse me, financial help from the government, whether it's Canada or the UK or Denmark or Norway. They're getting in some places, a portion, uh, 80, 90 percent of their salary every month. Canada people are getting two thousand dollars a month. Uh, we got a paltry one time payment of twelve hundred dollars. That's not helping the average person who's hurting right now, is it? 
Well, it's certainly not helping enough uh, for a lot of people. You know, um, you're right. There are countries that committed early on to recurring payments rather than this one off, a one time $1,200 check. I call it stimulus. I don't call it <laughs> stimulus because I think the idea is basically to keep people, to keep us staying in place, just mm -hmm. to try to contain it and hold it all together. Um, you know, what are people mostly doing with that money? Well, if you didn't need it, because a lot of people will, will say, look, I didn't actually need it. I still have my job. My income is, uh, no, I face no disruption in my income. I can pay my rent and I'm, you know, I, so maybe these people will hold on to it, save it for a little while. A lot of people are using it to buy groceries mm -hmm. and pay some recurring expenses, pay the utility bill, m make a rent payment, but you can't stretch $1,200 very far in this economy, uh, you know, you can buy a few groceries and maybe cover, maybe cover a month of rent, um, and then it runs out. Right. So the the real thing that Congress did, which was very good, was the expansion of unemployment insurance and including non-traditional workers, allowing gig workers and others to apply for and get unemployment compensation, and then that extra six hundred dollars a week that the federal government is kicking in, it has actually been um, very, very important and it has protected incomes. And in some cases, actually in many cases, the frontline low income workers who were the earliest to lose jobs are um, see, have seen their incomes protected in total, right? And in many cases, they're actually bringing in a little bit more now than they were making in their very low wage jobs uh, that they were working when they were employed. So. But the problem is, of course, that's going to run out. Right, right. And now, now let's bring modern monetary theory into this, right? What, how would um, an administration who operated under a uh, monetary policy such as modern monetary theory differ from what this administration is doing? Well, I think that uh, one of the main things is that you don't place arbitrary caps on your um, fiscal response because, you know, look look at the Small Business Administration, the so-called Paycheck Protection Program, mm -hmm. right? That was in the CARES Act. That was that um, third piece of legislation that Congress passed, the $2.2 trillion. So that's the biggest one we've seen so far. And that was designed to keep workers attached to their employers, to keep them on payroll. And Congress said, okay, we'll stick a certain number on this. We'll call it, I think it was 348 billion or so. Okay. And that's the program. Well, that quickly ran out, right? So in one of the answers to your question is these caps are a problem. And the reason that we put caps on things is to contain the amount of spending that we're willing to do. And if you were working from an MMT perspective, you would say, what is the problem we're trying to solve? Put the money piece aside, because that's the easy part. We mm -hmm. can always appropriate funding in whatever size we deem necessary to handle the problem we're trying to solve. So MMT would ask us to figure out what the problem is and design the policy to address the problem if it's keeping people attached to their employers on payroll so they don't become unemployed then you don't set up all of these arbitrary hoops you run it through banks who were ill-prepared we just didn't execute well and so i think you know recognizing that you have to stand ready to provide whatever funding is necessary to solve the problems that you're trying to solve without placing arbitrary restrictions on the size of the amount of money that can be borrowed, too many restrictions on how that money had to be used. A lot of employers didn't think that they uh, could keep workers on payroll. A lot of employers said, wait, you're requiring me to spend 75% of the money on payroll, but actually my payroll costs are low. It's my rent and my utilities that are high because I'm in a high rent district or something like that. So that's one of the problems and and if if you were all of a sudden you know steven mnuchin called you in and said all right stephanie kelton we need a different um uh mindset here we need a different um uh, you know m way of looking at things what would your advice be how would you get us through this mess well look i think that it's almost impossible to go too big there are going to be um you know, inefficiencies are going to be people who get money who, in retrospect, you think, well, we shouldn't have made that loan or we shouldn't have um, provided that form of assistance. But 
you know, in some ways, Nicole, it's almost like you wish you could just have everybody, uh, you know, take an oath and say under penalty of perjury and and uh, fraud and prosecution and so forth, I am going to log into this website. I'm going to answer this series of questions. There are countries have, that have rolled out something like this, where you know you answer six or seven questions and you say, "Are you facing hardship? Yes or no?" Yeah, mm -hmm. you click the button. What are your recurring expenses? You click the button. How much income, cash flow, do you currently have? You click the button. What is your estimated shortfall in terms of necessary recurring expenses? You say, my current uh, recurring shortfall is $1,700 a month, $2,300 a month, $3,500, whatever it is. And you click the next button, and that's the disbursement that comes. Wow. Okay? And three days from now, you've got that money in your, in your paycheck. You say, I'm protecting my... Um, workers, I'm keeping them on payroll, I'm paying my utilities, none of this, you know, I was also thinking about buying a car, so I want to factor that in. No, no, no. This is for, you know, necessary recurring expenses to uh, allow companies, businesses, small businesses in particular, to avoid shuttering, right? To avoid going under, mm -hmm. to keep their workers protected, to keep families protected so that they don't get evicted from their apartments, so that they don't end up losing their homes, so that their credit is not permanently impaired by this. I mean, that's the sort of big, big time uh, intervention that could hold the whole thing together. Because you know what? We have the real economy and then we have the financial side of everything. We ought to be able to pause the real economy without having everything completely fall apart. And the reason that things start to completely fall apart is because of the financial piece. It's that chain of interconnected um, payment commitments, debt, right? You got to pay your rent. You got to pay your utilities. You have a car payment. You have this. You miss one of those. And then there's someone on the other side, a lender who doesn't receive a payment they were counting on, who mm -hmm. then can't turn around and meet their payments. So you got to figure out where you need to press on the financial chain to alleviate the strain that allows everything to kind of stay together until we're through this thing. It, it is frightening. And, and uh, look, in your lifetime, this is this is what you do. You're an economist. This you're you, you deal with this on a daily basis. Have you ever thought we'd get to a point where we're seeing numbers like this and an outlook like this? Well, no, I mean, not to this scale. But look, one of the things that um, my colleagues and I, the MMT academic economists who have been, you know, thinking a lot about ways to have government policy respond to build a more resilient economy for more than 20 years, we've been um, urging lawmakers to think about adopting a, a jobs program. Mm -hmm. We call it a federal job guarantee or public service employment. You could say we want to build a care force. I mean, I don't care really how you describe it, but the idea is that you need a public option in the labor market. We needed to have something that was in place and capable of immediately absorbing people as they became unemployed. Well, as their uh, employers let them go or furloughed them, laid them off, they could immediately transition into another form of employment. Instead of becoming unemployed, the government hires them, they remain employed, they have benefits, they're protected, their incomes are protected through this process. And it's a program that should be in place in good times and in bad. And if all of a sudden 20 million people are without work, that program is there and you immediately hire those 20 million people into the program. You replace um, much or in some cases all of the lost income, depending on what they were making before. They keep their health care because mm -hmm. the benefits mm -hmm. uh, are part of the package and so forth. So, you know, we weren't thinking, wow, this is a program that's going to be important when we lose 20 million jobs in a month. But we were thinking that um, capitalist economies go through a business cycle. And there are never enough jobs, not even in the best of times, for everyone who wants employment but can't find it anywhere else in the economy. There ought to be an option even in the best of times, but in the worst of times, when the bottom is falling out and millions of people are losing jobs, there should be a program that can respond automatically to absorb these people, provide incomes, maintain some benefits. And so that's something we've been working on for a really long time. 
And is there, I mean, I, I'm hoping that uh, a Democratic administration will come in in January and, and fix things. Has anyone in the Biden campaign reached out to you by any chance? Well, I'm not going to answer that <laughs> no. question exactly okay. yet. Um, well, good. All right. Well, that's all I'm going to say right now. <laughs> all right. Well, we'll leave it there, and I'll take that as a bit of uh, uh, good news, uh, hopefully, to be coming soon. So um, I, I've kept you on a while. I, let's talk about the book, The Deficit Myth. It comes out in just about three weeks, or a little less than a month. Um, and it tells about modern monetary theory. I guess this is a really good time for this book to come out, huh? You know, it's funny. I uh, I broke my arm a couple of years ago. I, I fractured my wrist and I had to have surgery and I had a plate and I had all this physical therapy. And it was a long time before I could actually turn my hand from mm. my palm being up to my palm being down, which meant I, it took a long time before I could type again mm. um, it, with any, you know, real speed. So it delayed the book quite a bit. And now, you know, I said to my husband a couple months ago, thank God I broke my arm. You know, because <laughs> I think the timing really, really is, it would, it would be difficult to have um, intentionally timed the release of the book any better, I think. Um, because on the one hand, you know, governments around the world are increasing spending without increasing taxes. In other words, deficit spending right. is happening all over the world on a huge scale. And you might think, oh, well, everybody's over the deficit myth because governments are just, you know, using deficits to address the weak economy and the health pandemic and so forth. But clearly you're already hearing, right, this drumbeat around oh my God, the deficits have gotten so big and the debt is increasing. And so we're gonna have to think about cutting social security mm. or Medicare or cutting budgets or you know the austerity um, drumbeat has already started. And that's really what this book is about. This book is designed chapter by chapter to help empower you know, regular people. This is not aimed at economists. This is, there are no, um, I don't think there are, any numbers in the book. There, huh. there are no models. There's no math. It's a book that, you know, it's meant to be um, accessible to anyone with a, you know, reading comprehension. <laughs> this mm -hmm. is about the only requirement. Um, but I really want to be able to empower people. So when we start hearing our uh, politicians talk about withdrawing fiscal support prematurely, which is what happened in the last crisis, right? right? We yep. withdrew fiscal support prematurely because everyone started to panic about deficits and debt. Mm -hmm. And that held back the recovery that cost us in terms of jobs. It cost people their homes. It cost people their livelihoods. We had a much more anemic uh, and slow recovery than we could have had if we'd remained you know, vigorous in terms of the use of fiscal policy. So I want this book to try to provide you know, some kind of a protective layer against this, um, in a sense, this virus of deficit hysteria that inevitably um, invades us whenever we see deficits increasing. Great. Uh, and it's, it's so needed right now. And again, this is what's starting to come with this next, the fifth round of, of stimulus or whatever we want to call it, um, with Republicans saying, oh, no, we're waiting. And Trump saying, oh, no, I'm not signing anything unless there's a payroll tax cut. Well, a payroll tax cut's not going to help anyone who's not working, right? I mean, it, it just, to me, makes no sense. Then again, I'm the layman here. Well, you're right. Uh, the payroll tax is uniquely beneficial to people who are still on payroll. Right. So that 6.2% of your paycheck that gets withheld every single month for Social Security and another 1.45 for Medicare, if that was done away with, it is tantamount to a uh, seven point, you know, nearly an eight percent increase in your take-home pay. That helps you if uh, if you're on payroll. Um, but what does it do to Medicare and Social Security? And it does nothing to help all the people who are not on payroll anymore. Well, here's the thing. So I have a chapter in my book, chapter six. And if um, if the Democrats understood, I think, uh, what I argue in chapter six, the idea of a payroll tax cut wouldn't be so threatening. 
because the reason that many Democrats recoil at the idea of a payroll tax cut is precisely what you just said. They think that it undermines the security, the solvency of Social Security. And what I explain in this chapter is that um, we can protect Social Security. The federal government can go on making every payment that it has promised to future retirees, their beneficiaries, and the disabled into the indefinite future with or without a trust fund that has a balance in it with or without sufficient payroll tax uh, withholdings. That's the point that I make in that chapter. And it, as long as Democrats continue to believe that the only way that Social Security survives is with enough payroll tax revenue and by shoring up trust funds and so forth, then I think the program is in real danger. Hmm. Uh, you got to be able to fight back on stronger grounds. And that's what chapter six of the book is all about. I, I can't wait to read it. The Deficit Myth is out on June 9th. It is available for pre-order at Amazon and all those other places. I'll put a link on the blog at uh, NicoleSandler.com and Bradblog.com. Uh, where today's show is posted and to give you uh, so you can pre-order it. Is there anything I didn't ask you that you think is important to tell people right now as we're all kind of freaking out, looking at these unemployment numbers, hearing, you know, recession, depression, all these uh, frightening terms thrown around? Anything I, I didn't touch on? You know, I would say one thing, and that is the urgent need to get aid to state and local governments. Mm -hmm. um, that should have been in, it absolutely should have been in the third spending bill, the, the CARES package. Right. The Democrats said, no, 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 don't worry. Uh, we'll get it next time. Uh, we're not done here. Those were the assurances that we were given when it didn't end up in that piece of legislation. And now Republicans are kind of starting to walk away, say, well, we're not in a real hurry to come back and do more. We want to sit back and wait and see how things play out. And we know how things are going to play out because, you know, if you're watching, if you're listening to what governors all over this country and mayors all over this country are telling you, they are telling you that the cuts are going to be absolutely brutal if they are forced into a position because their revenues are collapsing around them. Right. And states and municipal governments, unlike the federal government, are absolutely dependent upon revenue in order to operate. They can't run deficits the way the federal right. government can. Right. And so they are begging, they are making it clear in no uncertain terms, if this money is not forthcoming, you are going to see cuts to police, fire, teachers, I mean, social services, it is going to be absolutely horrific. And if you think about, you know, 20 million job losses plus in April, what we're going to face when state and local governments all turn themselves into little Herbert Hoovers mm. and start right with the austerity at the state level, uh, it is just going to make an already catastrophically bad jobs picture and wow. economic picture that much worse. Wow. So I think the pressure has to be brought to bear. The Democrats have to stay firm on this, use whatever leverage they might have left, um, and this time, you know, use it effectively to um, extract uh, concessions and get this in the next piece of legislation, or we are in real trouble. Well, that's uh, important information. Thank you for that. Stephanie Kelton, again, the book, The Deficit Myth, hits stores on the, uh, the 9th of June. Pre-order it now. I can't wait to read it because, I, I, again, I'm, you know, I'm your average person who knows how to spend money, and that's, that's about it. So um, and these days, don't have much to spend. So Stephanie Kelton, thank you for being a voice of reason, and thank you for joining us today. I really appreciate it. Thanks always, Nicole. Take care of yourself. You too. Hello again. Do you have any thoughts about Nicole Sandler's conversation with Stephanie Kelton? If you do, the floor is yours. Personally, I am seeing so much stuff going on in our country and around the globe that I do honestly and deeply believe that we find ourselves at a pivotal time. Now, I have no idea what's waiting for us on the other side. No one realistically could. But it does seem to me that how we act in the present is going to determine that outcome. I don't think that it is a mystery why the countries that have been the most afflicted by COVID are also the ones that have the most wholeheartedly embraced neoliberalism 
and the politics of austerity. Look at the United States. Look at the United Kingdom. Look at Bolsonaro's Brazil. This is not sustainable. And we gotta get good <laughs> if we stand a chance of things getting better now more than ever. Well, that's all that I have for y'all today. I hope that you enjoyed this video and that you'll be back for another episode next week. Keep being great, y'all. Take care.